Welcome to Compilation Arena. Please like the video and subscribe the channel. It really helps me keep going. Comment about anything and everything, I'm here to listen. Musha Kutensai, Jobless Reincarnation. Volume 9. Part 2. Therefore, Luke said that even if he didn't approve of it, he would not oppose the decision, and closes his eyes in a non-committal manner. This matter caused a bit of a fluster among the nobles. Setting aside their own desires. Even if the princess is pleased with Sophie. Sophie might not hold the same feelings towards the princess. The hunter's daughter, a victim swallowed up by the metastasis. Even with that fact, from there on there would be friction with the princess. For example, the others of the first prince faction were likely to take advantage of her. When considered, by no means would Sylphie be permitted to be near the side of the princess. The reason being, that all Azura nobles are malicious. Supposing, if Sylphie was just a village daughter having no power at all. And in addition to that somehow it was allowed. However, the existence of Sylphie had exceeded the category of village daughter. Having intermediate class chantless magic, even if there were some crude bits of commoner, she also understood the importance of etiquette. Her existence was a mystery indeed. I wonder, where in the world did you learn etiquette at? Um, in my village, I had been accepting instruction from a kind person called Lelia San. Lelia. The moment the name appeared, Ariel's impression improved further. Lelia. I remember her. When I was a child, oneself was presented with a person which defended myself, she was a maid of the Imperial Guard. And then the impressions of the nobles worsened further. The Imperial Guard made of the inner palace, the story of her becoming unable to work due to injuries, and the story of her dismissal had been heard before. Mostly it was slips of the tongue that talked about secretly dealing with someone who knew secrets from the inner palace. Lelia had escaped to the Fedoa region. Um, Lelia San, ah, she served Rudy's father, whose name is Paul. Paul, you said? The new name appeared. Paul noticed Grey Rat. If one speaks of Paul, it is known he is a man famous for being a bad boy of the Notice family. There were rumors that he held a grudge against the former head of the family as well. A maid of the inner palace, taken in by the absconded son of upper nobility, instilling etiquette in the user of chantless magic. This was too good to just be left to chance. To the nobles, who are absorbed in schemes, it was no longer possible to think of this as fiction. Investigating further was pointless, since Fedoa region had already disappeared. It was difficult to ascertain the truth of the matter. Now what should we do? HMPH. The nobles worried. Ariel rarely says selfish things. And it was true that the seat of the guardian magician was open. Although Sylphie was originally a commoner, she had certifiable skill as a magician, and knows etiquette even though it is imperfect. The ability is not bad. And because it is not bad, there must be vigilance. One of the Grey Rats belongs to the Second Princess faction. The one who is called Luke and is symbolically the Guardian Knight. For Ariel, the Notice, are an ally. However Paul Grey Rat is a man who threw away his title after some discord with his parents. If they are an enemy of the Notice, then consequently there is the possibility that they are an enemy of Ariel as well. Was Sophie not aware of that when she gave the name of Paul? What was the meaning of that? If she wanted to receive the trust of Ariel, she should not have given out the name of Paul. That's something she should have understood. Then, because she gave the name out, does it imply that they are not an enemy? However if that's the case in doing so, then who in the world is the mastermind that is pulling the strings of this girl? At least, there is no mistaking that they are indeed an enemy of notice. However the people who want to be hostile to the large noble family of Grey Rat are few indeed. Saying and doing, it seems all the Grey Rat are identical in that. And so they hit upon something. Of the similar Grey Rat, there was one person unfriendly with Flame and who was the current family head. It was Sauros Boreas Grey Rat. 
Saul Uroz was always backbiting and criticizing that Paul should have become the family head, and not Philemon. However he was not the type of person who would involve such a young girl in politics. If that's the case then there is another one. Philip Boreas Grey Rat. If it is him then, he would crush the second princess whom Notus supports, someone like him could definitely wind his hand around the strings of this young girl. Saul Uroz and Philip, and even Rudius, they are all missing when the Fido territory disappeared. Supposing, that they were the ones to cause the metastasis event, under this guise, it was possible to have something moving in the shadows even now. Their first approach might just be a girl named Sylphiot. If it's the case that Saul Uroz isn't taking part, then the ringleader is Philip, for the sake of entrapping James who is to be the next family head there is the possibility he may be acting to that end. For the Boreas to usurp the seat of the next family head, it revolves around the supportive position of the second princess, and instead they try to become the support instead or something like that. If that's the case, then the Sylphie who has been sent, can be considered an ally. In neither case. The person pulling the strings is either Saul Uroz, or Philip. So the nobles concluded. The groundless suspicion was complete. Then a certain noble had a shocking idea. I know, how about shaking things up by making it look like she's the genius boy Rudius himself. If Saul Uroz moves, it is likely that Rudius would be with them. If the rumors are true, then the ability Rudius is said to have is tremendous. It's highly likely that Saul Uroz and company are keeping Rudius on hand as a trump card hiding as much of his existence now, for the sake of adorning his future sensational debut. When they appear, Rudius, as a person with a legitimate blood relationship to notice, comes out in the absence of those who were too afraid to act. As a powerful piece who then takes part in backing the first prince whom Boreas supports. Sophie is assumed to be the person whom they sent. If we reveal her as Rudius, it may be possible to hinder their plans. If we do some shaking, it may be possible to have them expose themselves. To this, other nobles expressed concern. Wouldn't we be exposed immediately? It may be better to conceal this one's social position by disguising her as a man. Be ready to evade any questions about him as much as possible. But what if she's actually a spy they sent to probe us? Like hell they will send someone that stands out as a chantless magician as a spy. On the contrary, they might assume we would value her. Either way, it will be easy to leak false information and draw them in. One by one the anxiety was crushed. The nobles began to think that even a worthless plan like this was a good idea. Indeed, if she is a spy then the fake information leaked will cause unrest in the enemy camp. And if they are unrelated, then we have gained a strong guardian magician without having done any work. And should they instead try and curry favor with us, we'll go along with it. But that's not all. She also resembles the princess in height. So we can tailor her to be a body double. If I remember correctly, we have such a magic item. Oh, a manly form should be made to leave on a regular basis, since there are suspicious people usually nearby, it will not be thought that it takes the shape of the guardian magician. As expected, the lord is a clever one. And then, the second princess guardian magician, Fitz, was formed. The chantless magic using, mysterious genius boy. Because his face has been hidden with sunglasses, no one could perceive his true identity. And the name is strongly associated to the Fitoa territory. 9. There was also a part that alluded to the genius boy who had been serving the Boreas family as well. However, there is nobody who would understand the true nature and breeding of this one. He should seldom speak, and when he must it should only be for a short while. And any distinctions on its actual gender should be difficult to identify. Such a boy was born. Sophie had no say in this matter. With the guarantee of one person on the promised arrangement of being able to search for information on the metastasis event, Sophie was granted no right to veto and also given no choice. Although she had nowhere to go either, she was coerced into becoming, Fitz. Pawn of the political power struggle. Thus, 
at any rate. Sophia became the guard, Fitz, to Ariel. Supplemental. Sophia's hair had become white due to the effect of the metastasis transition itself, as well as exhausting all the magical power she had, and being in a state of absolute terror before and after the fall. 10. Sophia's life suddenly changed. She went from living life as an ordinary village girl, to living life as a royal guard. The first order of business was a complete overhaul of her wardrobe. Received from the guardian magician who died, were a cloak, boots and gloves. Gale boots, which allowed the wearer to run several times faster than normal. Cloak of perpetual warmth, that regulated the body temperature, preventing sudden illness. Overwhelming gloves, having all impact damage received near the palm. All of these articles were, magic items. A special undergarment was newly ordered for Sylphie. Bustier of the steel threaded silk worm. It is made with fibers that resist most blades, however it cannot withstand an attack by someone using skills of the sword god style, rather it's more for preventing wounds from the level of a thrown dagger. In addition, a magic tool that changes color and orients in the direction of a certain person when an impending crisis to them approaches. Sunglasses of the Rescuer While allowing the face to remain hidden, it allows perception of the crisis state of the princess instantaneously. This is a full set of the rarest of equipments. If an adventurer saw it, they might become stricken with jealousy and try to take it for themselves. There was also the opinion of giving Sylphie a certain wand, but Sylphie refused it. The wand she was using presently, was the beginner's wand she had received from Rudeus. It was her sole property. And so she desperately did not want to part with it. It was after all the wand that felled the terminate bore in one shot. No one was going to force the issue. Even her eating habits had changed drastically. In Buina village, the staple food was something akin to a crusty brown bread and vegetable soup. And the main dish would be the rabbit or bird her father had fetched. These were the kinds of meals that Sophie knew. But even though Sophie was from a poor family in Buina village, because it was part of the bountiful Azura kingdom, there were no cases of hunger or starvation to worry about. But now the meals had changed to that of the grand feasts of the imperial court of Azura kingdom. A thick, rich and hearty soup served with tender white bread. Meat and fish covered in abundant spices and slow cooked for a long time. Salad made with fresh raw vegetables and then followed up with the dessert. It was all far too luxurious for Sylphie. Although even if it was such a luxurious dish, her job as a guard made it required for her to eat until the very end, she had to retire after seeing exactly how much those of the upper-level nobility could eat. The similar yet lower-ranking guard, was Luke. However, the difference in the quality of meals here compared to those of Buina village was like the difference between heaven and earth. For Sylphie, living every day in the palace was like living in a dream. Her only dissatisfaction was the lack of freedom in personal time. Still, she kept strengthening her body, and managed to find the time to keep practicing magic. Of course, she was concerned with what happened to Rudeus and Buina village. Although information was being collected, the feudal lord James Boreas Greyrat had fled in an effort to save his own neck so the search hardly advanced at all. The minister Darius, however, made a move by helping a person named Alphonse, who at one point was a butler of Saw Uros, to establish a refugee camp. The outlook there, however, was grim. Sophie insisted that she would go to take a look, even traveling by her own feet if necessary, but that was rejected. She was told she just had to wait, while properly doing her job as a guard. Sophie continued to perform the guard work, as she was told. At first, it was a string of continual failures. Especially when making public appearances. No matter how much etiquette she absorbed, not everything was perfectly understood. She failed her table manners, she failed in greeting others in the hallways, and she failed in the various ceremonies she was required to attend. Her failures became the targets of scorn and antagonism towards the second princess. Even if they are said to be the genius boy, 
apparently that genius doesn't extend into using manners properly. Even if it wasn't the full truth, the malice could be heard. Sophie recalled the time she had been bullied. It almost made her legs lock up in fear. However, she didn't cower away. Because despite everything being said, none of the scorn was directed at Sylphie herself. No, it was being directed towards Rudeus. For Sylphie, that wasn't something she could possibly endure. If it was Rudeus, if Rudeus was in this situation, he would probably endure it though. If Rudeus could do it, it was imperative that she was also able to do it if she ever wanted to stand equal to him. And while thinking that, a passionate feeling gushed out from inside Sophie's chest. Afterwards, she took care to ensure that similar mistakes never occurred again, and had moved about with meticulous care. For the things she had not already learned, immediately after learning it, she practiced it over and over. The first thing was changing the way she referred to herself as, to Baco 11, then she did her best imitation of Rudeus, and came to behave in the ways of a man. Luke had reacted to such an action favorably though. He is a ladies' man, as admitted pridefully by himself and others. Sophie had observed how good he was at making women fall for him, analyze their preferences being his motto. Because she had observed him properly, she had found that he did have some good parts to him. Particularly, it's his special ability. And it is entirely limited to conversing with women. Luke had seen the desperation that plagued Sophie. Watching the earnestness of effort, something that was rarely, if ever, seen in noble women. To keep her sights on nothing but one point, and to eagerly overtake the point that she continually aimed for. For Luke, watching Sophie make such an effort day after day, naturally he had come around to supporting her secretly supplementing the parts he knew that she was lacking, and stealthily teaching her the parts that she did not know at all, he had become a shadow of support for her. A shadow only. Because around here, there was a reason he was popular. And Sophie had noticed it. However, Sophie did not fall in love with Luke. In her heart there was no crevice filled with anything other than thoughts of Rudeus. And Luke also seemed to have no interest in the chopping board characteristics particular to the long ear tribe, elves. Instead, a strange friendship began to bud between these two people. Luke himself had few friends. He was born into the House of Notice, and was quickly entered into the Second Princess faction. Being close in age, and partly being forced into it, he was appointed as her guardian knight and had spent every day training for the duties that accompanied it. There was nobody who he could call his equal, just a person to look up at or down upon. This was even the case with former guardian magician Derek. When after considering the age difference and experiences, it was not easy at all to say they were even close to being equal. Only Sylphie was an understanding existence that could finally be called equal to Luke. Perhaps to him she could have been the only one worthy enough to be called his friend. While getting along well with Luke behind the scenes, Sophie and Ariel also continued to deepen their bonds of friendship. However, the opening act never ends smoothly. At that time in her life, Ariel was an extreme sadist. She was a girl who felt a particular excitement tormenting others. The likely cause of this was something that lingered behind after all the time she had nearly been assassinated. At first, Ariel did small things, like ordering the maid of one of her guards to perform cleaning duties while stark naked, while others included Ariel herself severely beating an errand boy with a horse crop. Perhaps you could call it a love of bullying the weak. Of course while her proclivities were concealed as much as possible, they were already established as a well-known fact in the imperial court. At first, Ariel only targeted those who were weak but gradually over time she lost interest in weak people, and instead came to be attracted to those she considered to be, strong people. By accomplishing the task of making a, strong person, prostrate and submit to her authority and position. It came to be that doing such things stimulated the princess. Luke was no good as a target. He never tried to show Ariel any of his strong parts. Omitting of course, the origin of Luke's feelings towards Ariel. 
Also, there was Sylphia's predecessor, the guardian magician Derek. That one never showed strength towards their master, Ariel. Nothing but obedience was shown. Mental strength and a rebellious spirit, men who didn't try and show these things were not at all of Ariel's taste. Most likely they were able to accomplish their job as Ariel's guard because none of them had anything that matched her taste. And then what about Sylphie? She felled the Terminate Boar with one shot using chantless magic, and while in a strange place, surrounded with strange company, she remained determined to do her best to learn strange manners? Tasty. Even if she was skilled in magic. Even if she was of a younger age. Even if she had white hair. Even if she had long ears. Even if she was diligent. And even if it seemed like there was a man she desired. All of it was to Ariel's taste. At first, Ariel endured the nagging desire. It was because Sophie saved her. Ariel owed Sophie her life. She still remembered the fear the Terminate Bore instilled when it appeared before her. If Derek hadn't pushed her away, Ariel's head most likely would have exploded and her brain splattered everywhere. If Luke hadn't protected her, Ariel's stomach and chest would likely have been torn apart. Neither Luke nor herself would be alive if not for Sylphie. The Terminate Boar is different from a goblin. It doesn't lay its eyes on a woman and consider violating her. It only rips the body apart as it feeds on it. Ariel's life had been saved, and as a respectful member of the Imperial Royal Family of Azura, repaying such a favor was surely necessary. However, such thoughts, began to gradually fade away. The Sylphie who eats delicious meals every day. The Sylphie who lives and works hard every day. Towards that Sylphie, Ariel speaks words of gratitude to the first time before preparing to eat such a tasty meal. Such a wicked happiness could be seen in the eyes of the princess. Of course, Sylphie being Sylphie, naturally she worried over her parents and Rudeus. But, at the same time, she knew Sylphie also recognized that she was now under the patronage of Ariel. So a bit of that attitude had emerged in her daily life. Seeing such an attitude, Ariel considered what to do. It's a good thing, right? I don't need to endure it anymore, right? Such a misunderstanding had led Ariel into planning the brutal assault. On a certain evening, Ariel went to Sylphia's bedroom, wielding the Azura Kingdom Purveyor's royal dildo, and attacked. It was to be a night of dazzling pink. After all, there was no one who ever defied the royal partner. So the virtue of Sylphie was about to be in a precarious position 12. Counter to the princess' expectations, Sylphie fought back. With blood-red eyes, she rushed straight at Ariel and fought back. In a half-dazed state, she retaliated. Sylphie threw aside all the manners and etiquette she had learned up until now. Sylphie did not have any deep feelings of respect towards the imperial family. And once, from Lilia, she had learned a bit of the night workings that went on in the imperial palace. Sylphie recognized the rape attempt on herself for what it was. Of course, there was gratitude towards Ariel. But this and that were two different stories. Sylphie with her powerful magic, had inflicted a wound on Ariel that nearly killed her. If. At that time, Sophie couldn't use healing magic, it would have become a serious problem. Actually, it had become a problem. Luke, who heard the screams of Sophie had rushed to the room. And there he saw the scene, a tattered Ariel, and a Sophie performing recovery on her. Ariel, the second princess who he was sworn to protect, had been wrecked. Luke, realizing the situation in a moment, knew that Ariel's bad habit had once again appeared. And at the same time he also thought the situation was a bit distasteful. Just by himself, it's impossible to cover these incidents up every single time. However if Ariel orders it, he will let fall the head of Sophie. This he understood intuitively. Luke shook. Does he kill his only friend to protect himself, or does he defend this friend who came from unworthy roots instead? However, that troublesome and groundless pondering was over in a moment. Being tormented, it is surprisingly pleasant. Ariel, it seems, had just awakened to a new proclivity. The royals and nobles of Azura, 
every single one of them has a strange proclivity. Masochism is no exception. Therefore, this one incident was treated as if it was a play. The victim, Ariel, had covered for, the assailant, Sylphie, as expected, since it was the only reasonable course of action to take. However the business of Ariel ever trying to continue her earlier failed attack on Sylphie never came to be. Our feelings and reasons to evade company would be normal after that. Mysteriously though, Sylphie in a sudden twist that day, instead came to feel a sense of trust from Ariel. She who was avoided by those of the same age, it was a special boy named Rudius who became her only friend. Also, Sylphie who was of a young age then, and whose secondary gender characteristics had not yet developed, had a weak sense of danger, and who had problems making strong personal connections. It's possible she was misled and directed defenselessly into the arms of someone with goodwill. Even though the reason was distorted, the thread of friendship was tied firmly between Ariel and Sylphie. Thereafter, little by little, Sylphie and Ariel began to deepen their friendship. One year had passed from the metastasis event, and circumstances would change. No, circumstances had already changed. In a place Sylphie couldn't know, and for a long time after the metastasis. This was the beginning of Lord Liston's thoughtless words. He, who was taking advantage of the opportune chance, spread it around the nobility that it was likely the doings of the first prince. At least, that was the reason given who could think that a demon would appear in the royal palace if it wasn't guided in by someone. And so, he laid the blame sufficiently well on the other party. Even devising ways to treat innocent people as criminals. However, when the story no longer required there to be a person to have led such a monster inside, the situation drastically changed. To this person who was using the abhorrent natural disaster, contempt was shown. This was an act most nobles have done. However, Lord Liston mistook his opportunity. Before the matter was settled as being a natural disaster, the fact of the other party having attacked had been delivered. A chance was then shown. First on the list of the Prince group, High Minister Darius harshly criticized Lord Liston at just the right moment. Lord Liston's authority sharply fell. Since most of his territory was lost, he had then become a middle-class noble. With his loss, the second princess faction, who even at their strongest was still weak, had received a further attack. High Minister Darius severely weakened the nobles of the second princess Ariel's faction. Influential nobles, in succession, had lost power, or betrayed the princess, causing the immediate collapse of the second princess faction. By losing a person of influential backing, the reality for Ariel, was that the road to the crown was also becoming lost to her. However, Ariel's charisma was extremely high. Her popularity among the people was also high. If she lived, it was expected that she would become an obstacle in the future. Darius advised the first prince on this matter, and had sent an assassin to put an end to Ariel. The influential nobles had been suppressed, so there were no longer any soldiers left to protect her. The elder brother assassinates the younger sister. To gain the throne of Azura kingdom, it must be one in such a race to power. Even the present king had done something similar to assume the throne. The princess faction has no defensive strength. And there is no way to stay an assassination by political means either. Ariel's life was now in a precarious situation 13. But, the assassination was prevented, by the hand of Sylphie alone. She had managed to turn the tables on the assassin. It was a desperate struggle. If she was not the apprentice of Rudius. If she didn't know how to use high-speed movement by shockwave through the usage of chantless melded magic. If she didn't see up close what Rudius was doing, and ask for what reason it was being done. If she didn't hear the theories and reasons behind it, and mimic it herself. And if the enemy hadn't underestimated her because she was a child. Sophie would probably have lost her life to the attack she received. The result however, was that Sophie had survived. Due to the poison the assassin used, she wandered between the worlds of life and death for three days, and fortunately for her, there were no traces of disabling after effects. As a result, 
the name of Fitz, who was once known as Sylphie, had become known widely in the royal palace. The rumors of the genius boy had been heard, was he a fake? It's possible they thought he was a counterfeit. To begin with, the positions of guardian knight and guardian magician have been a tradition of the royal family passed down since olden times, the position is usually filled by spare children of powerful nobility as offerings. When an assassin is sent, they die bravely in their protection of the royal family. The noble parents grieve exaggeratedly about how brave their child's death was. The royal family acknowledges it by sending a medal of honor as recompense to the family, and in this way, noble and royal bonds are deepened. Their very existence amounted to only such a thing. You could call it a sacrificial pawn, a display piece. However Sophie was quite different. Although her actual fighting experience was lacking, she was by far a talented magician. To hear the report of the repelled assassin, Darius had revealed his concern. The assassin whom he released on her possessed that much skill after all. The First Prince faction became cautious. And Ariel's group feared it. Thinking they would be killed sooner or later if they remained in the royal palace. They had only a few allies remaining. Just the several servants who were at hand, and one remaining influential noble. An assassin had brazenly shown up in the room of the imperial family, yet no one was blamed for it. However, the issue was more that such a matter was not even questioned. The leading noble of the aerial faction, Philemon Notus Greyrant, summed up the pressing state of affairs. Please escape, Ariel Sama. Only death awaits you here. You are saying I should run away? Darius is friendly with me, so I will enter into the First Prince faction, and weaken their power from within. Ariel Sama then gathers her power in the lands of a foreign country, creates alliances, then returns when she sees the opportunity and by then I should be reconstituted and ready for action. Philemon was a clever man. For him, the ending where Ariel is king, is the most profitable one. While he had pretended to gain favor with Darius so that notice did not fall even if Ariel died, he had taken steps to ready a hand to be played for either situation's outcome. Following that advice, refuge was to be taken far away in a foreign land and there she would gather her strength and bide her time. Ariel did not know of such things. But it was clear that she would be killed the way things were going. There were many places where she could go to study abroad. Some were large countries such as Dragon King Kingdom or the Holy Land of Millies that were included as candidates. However, Ariel chose the north. The magic city Sharia, of the Renoa Kingdom was the destination. To the Magic Academy the Magic Triumvirate, was so proud of. In other countries, the number of allies she would be able to borrow power from for a dispute against Azura would be insufficient. Nobody would want to back a quarrel against a monster nation that had an abundance in funding. However, if the Academy gathered all races from all countries of the world, it would soon become known as the Second Prince's Foothold of Restoration. Ariel had not yet given up. Ariel was alive and also the path to becoming king. It was not just noble's idle talk. She who was born to the Azure royal family, had understood her destiny. Sylphie, my apologies. Ariel was aware there was no reason for Sylphie to accompany her on this journey. She had already cleared away almost all distrust she may have had of Sylphie. Paul's name was now associated with the Fedoa territory search party and was confirmed to be unrelated to the metastasis event. Saw Uros nonchalantly turned up at the imperial palace unaware of what had happened, and had been executed by the schemes of Philemon and the second prince faction. At this point, the whereabouts of Philip and Rudius were unknown. And only looking at Saw Uros' excuses and her dedication regarding the assassin, Sophie was found to be innocent. Merely, another victim of the metastasis event, now that it's become like this, while I think that it's only right of me to release you, I humbly ask this of you instead, please protect me. There is no one else I can rely upon but you. I also beg this of you, my sword is not yet sharp 14. And I have no confidence that I can protect Ariel Sama by myself. 
Ariel and Luke, bowed their heads to Sylphie whose social position was far lower than their own. Sylphie, who wanted to search for her family and Rudeus on her own two feet. However, in this one year, Sylphie had come to think of them as friends. Friends with some peculiarities that tended to stand out, and whose relations with her were a bit different than that of Rudeus. Sylphie felt strongly that a friend is a friend. And for Sylphie, the number of friends she had was easily counted on one hand. I understand. I will continue to protect Ariel Sama. Sylphie, at that moment, may have possibly become the princess guardian magician in the truest literal sense. They had left the Azura kingdom under the guise of studying abroad. Their current state, out of fear of assassination, appeared to be nothing more than throwing aside everything and fleeing from the country immediately. Though that was but half the truth. Inevitably, the first prince had sent a pursuit party after them. He was aware of the risk a still living Ariel possessed. Her charisma might allow her to captivate the magic guild. Furthermore, there were also the children of other Azura nobles attending the academy. She might give them, the second who couldn't carry the next generation, or the thirds whose heart could be swayed, the way to become the head of their houses, since there were many ways it could be done by assisting Ariel. In addition, there were many various nobles and royalty to be found in other countries and tribes. If Ariel, who has extremely high charisma, were to return after attaining strong ties with foreign countries, the First Prince faction thought that it would be best to make this attack somewhat excessive. The pursuit of the Prince's party continued even after they left the borders of the Azura Kindgum. There were fifteen nobles which comprised this party. And whenever one was alone, they always lost their lives in their surprise attack. In particular, the surprise attack at the Red Dragon's Upper Jaw was thoroughly severe. About ten swordsmen, a magician for support and a healer that laid in wait. All of the previous surprise attacks were in preparation for this ambush. This sure kill formation, however, was crushed entirely by the hand of Sylphie. The chantless magic combat techniques that Rudeus had thought up were highly effective here. Though Sylphie was in the ceremonial position of guardian magician, she had never neglected strengthening her body. And she had even learned how to swing a sword from Luke when he could spare the time to teach. And though it was just a thin layer, her body had recently begun to wear fighting spirit. All of the attacks had stopped when Ariel's party had crossed over the Red Dragon's upper jaw. Excluding Sylphie and Luke, the number of Ariel's noble servants had been reduced to merely two others. The First Prince faction didn't have the nerve to send an assassin into a country where they couldn't keep a close eye on things. The sure kill formation had been destroyed, and for an opponent they couldn't kill within their own borders, there was little confidence in finishing the job in another country's. This was a mistake on the part of the first prince faction. If the attack was repeated two or three more times, the probability of Ariel dying would likely be very high. If her servants hadn't been risking their lives to protect the princess, it could not be expected that Sylphie alone would be able to manage that duty. However, the first call of the prince's lack of judgment on this matter, was no doubt owing to the combat prowess of Sylphie. After the ordeal they made it to Renoa Kingdom. Five people unaccustomed to traveling to a foreign country. Only two servants remained. Elmore Blue Wolf. Clean Elrond. Both of them were young ladies. The middle-aged servants who knew the fundamentals of the journey had already died. There was bad planning delayed traveling time, and the matter of it becoming winter en route. The dangerous pursuit party, and the villagers' complacency began to wear thin the patience of the group, and almost led to disaster. They probably were seen as a delicious morsel to a monster or bandit. Along the way they were attacked many more times. However every attack was repelled. Many more difficulties as well waited for them. When they got to Magic City Sharia, and were met with many further complications, they felt the bonds between themselves had strengthened. They were comrades. Sophie had entered the Magic Academy. Both the Magic Academy and the Magic Guild welcomed the Azura royal family, and promised to handle them as, special students. However, 
Ariel refused. She wished to be treated as and mixed in with the general students until the very end, so in this way she arranged to be able to acquire a sufficient amount of interaction with other students. Ariel's calculations were elaborate. How should she gain power while in these lands? If she were to just be satisfied using the name of Azura royalty, she would not be able to accomplish such a great feat. Like a game of chess, she must use her pieces effectively. First of all, as Ariel's, might, Sophie was best shown off in the position of guard. Luke, also a guard, though without any real power, was better placed in the position to show generosity and gentleness, kept closely on hand. Ariel herself would take the position as a, symbol of admiration. And she decided that her two servants, Clean and Delmore would devote themselves to the work that could only be done in the shadows. Sophie was able to continue with her disguise unchanged. When guarding Ariel, she would conveniently dress in clothes suitable for a woman. However, the best way to show, might, would be to emphasize it by, mystery. An unseen face and an unspoken opinion, was it a boy? Was it a girl? Who knows? An extremely strong guard who used chantless magic. The fact alone that this person was guarding the princess, was all that was important. It made the existence of the princess even more grand. Also, if you don't understand your opponent's true nature, then there will be hesitation when it came to starting trouble with them. The main duty of the two servants was information gathering. Mixing with the general students, detailed rumor collection, and manipulating information. The job was really that of a covert operative. Those girls, who would casually contact Luke at times while pretending to be his groupies, would then relay information. Regular information included various things about the Fedoa search party, personal information about enrolled students of the academy the Azura Kingdom situation reports, and information about nearby influential adventurers. Luke's job was to act the part of the fool, and receive the information naturally. As a familiar face, continually posing as a sociable person. Although since Luke was originally a ladies' man, his posturing would be less of an act. In an unknown land, unacquainted with people of differing cultures, suddenly rising to power through associations. Failure cannot be allowed to happen here. Ariel gradually wasted away. In the situation in which failure must not be allowed to happen, without any kind of relaxation, continuously playing the part of a symbol. With no relaxation time, her great spirit had been whittled away. Still, she did somehow manage it for the first several months. Sophie had become Ariel's confidant because it would help alleviate the stress her body had accumulated. However, certain information had arrived. The updated death roster of Fidoa territory. In other words, it was information on the death of Sylphie's parents. From this, even Sylphie was closed off and in low spirits as could be expected. Sylphie, having desperately made it this far, hearing about her parents' deaths took a heavy toll. Her one hope had been destroyed in an instant. Brooding, seclusion. The situation did not allow for it. Ariel away stood away. Sifi was worn out. And the two servants who couldn't become used to their new way of life, it was hardly a situation where there could be worry about another person. Only Luke seemed to be fine. Because he had the optimistic and undaunted characteristic unique to the Grey Rat House, he always seemed to be in the same state no matter where he was. The stability of his mind was likely helped by his so-called Upper Azura Noble's Lady Fishing circumstances. Luke wondered if there wasn't some way he couldn't be helping with the current situation. However, in his knowledge, if a woman was depressed, the only solution was to comfort her in his arms. Apart from the two servants, he had no intention of holding Ariel nor Sophie. For Luke. These two people had leapt over the category of love interest into that of a special existence. He was troubled. He wondered if there was anything he could do. Then he suddenly remembered. At one time, there was the example of the genius boy who gave lessons to the brutal monkey of the Boreas house, being the seventh or tenth day of every month, he created a thing called a holiday, and quieted the anger of the monkey. 
even to a certain man with habits of debauchery, it was especially important to have a little bit of something like a breather. Once every ten days they would be allowed to cut loose and go wild. Because of that, he proposed venting stress in such a way. Ariel, though she was worried about its effectiveness, agreed to it. Sylphie, also desiring some alone time, also agreed to it. However there was one concern. Ariel's existence must become that of a symbol. And such an existence, if she were to be found cutting loose in the town once every several days, what would other people think of that? Ariel must be a symbol. She must not be allowed to appear the same as any girl around here. Everything that took great pains to begin building up absolutely must not be destroyed now. But such anxiety was easily solved by the existence of a certain magic tool. A magic tool that allows the user to take the shape of another. This magic tool took the form of two rings, a green ring, and a red ring. The person wearing the green ring would become identical in facial features and hair color to the person wearing the red ring. This magic tool was a secret treasure passed down in the Azura Kingdom family from generation to generation. This magic tool was meant to be worn by the body double of the Azura Kingdom. For Ariel and Sylphie, at times when they would go on holiday, this tool was used to disguise Ariel, so any assailant size would be deceived. Using this magic tool, height and build, voice, even the eye color was unchanged. If observed well, or if one was heard conversing in its form, they can easily become exposed. However it was satisfactory enough. Using this, Ariel changed herself into Sylphie. Sylphie always had a reason to wear sunglasses, and furthermore lived a life where she hardly spoke. And also, since all of her magic was done chantless, it was convenient. There was no real high difference between Ariel and Sylphie. It was really quite convenient. Using this, Ariel became, Fitz. And as, Fitz, it became possible for Ariel to move about the whole town. During this time, it was necessary that Sophia be in a rather deserted place. As for the location, she chose the quiet library. She planned to examine the event that had killed her parents. And so, this was the way in which Sophie and company led their lives at the Magic Academy. The past few years since I've started school have gone by without any problems. When I say no problems, I mean problems which put my life at risk. Dueling with Rinia and Persina, Ariel saw me walking down streets disguised as me and being surrounded by thugs. Small stuff like that happened, but nothing life-threatening. Things were going the way Ariel saw me wanted. In the last few years, Ariel Sama has increased her followers as well. However, after entering the third year, we obtain certain information. The information is about a person called Rudius of the Quagmire. Rudius. So, I finally found some information on Rudy. At a young age he was already an A-rank adventurer, and in just a few years his name spread to the Magic Triumvirate. His specialty is Earth Magic. His strength level is not determined, but he can create a huge quagmire with voiceless incantation. When I heard about quagmire magic, I was convinced that it was Rudy. When I think about it, the first time we met he was using mud. Since Rudy is a water magician, thinking that he is good with water magic would be normal, but, whether it's using quagmire or a fast-moving shockwave, he liked using different kinds of magic like that. I spoke to Ariel Sama about this. Rudius of the Quagmire is the person who taught me how to use magic, and, he is the person who has been missing for a long time. If he is the real deal, I would certainly like to borrow his power. I think that Ariel Sama was skeptical about Rudy. Since the information on Rudius of the Quagmire was indeed dubious. Rudius Grey Rat. He was from Azura Kingdom, Fedora region, Buina village. At the age of three he became an apprentice to the, Water Saint ranked at the time, Water King class magician Roxy Migarudia. At the age of five he became a Water Saint magician. At the age of seven he became the tutor for the daughter of the Lord of Fidoa, Erisporias Grey Rat. 
As the story goes, the troublemaker and violent daughter of the Lord was properly disciplined and educated by him. At that time when the Fedora region metastasis event happened he went missing. In the past, even if I heard this much I wouldn't think it's particularly a great thing. But now that I have lived in the Azura Kingdom and studied at the Magic University, I can say this with confidence. If I didn't know him I would have thought that this kind of personal history is a fake. It's fictional. But, I know. Rudy respected Roxy Sensei as his Shizo. Though I never saw Roxy myself. But, I know that Roxy San was in Buena Village. And, Roxy San gave Rudy a wand. And when we were separated at the age of seven, he became a home tutor, this matches as well. There is no mistake, it's Rudy. Sylphie, if you say so, I would like to believe it. However, since it is just a rumor, actually. I am dubious anyhow. Luke and Ariel Sama were skeptical. However for now they believed it, not that I can do anything about it. Even for me who knew Rudy, I still doubt the credibility of this information. However, will such a great person lend us a hand, isn't he a member of the Boreas family? Honestly, I'm not familiar with how political power struggles are in the Azure Kingdom. I just have one year of experience in this matter. However, with respect to Greyrant, even I have heard about them. Boreas was allied with the first prince. Eurus and Zephyrus were allies of the second prince. Notus was our ally, but was now in the first prince faction. In other words, Boreas is an enemy. And, even Rudy who was a tutor of Boreas, might be an enemy as well. However, Boreas and Rudy ought to have cut their ties with each other a long time ago already. If it was not like that, he could not be an adventurer in the north. If I ask him, I am sure. Even though I am saying it, I myself have no confidence. Luke started laughing at such words lacking confidence. With your breast size, there is no way a man from notice would bow to you. I cover up my breast bukotsu. When Luke says that. Luke is always like this. Always talking about breasts. Women's breasts. Women with no breasts are not women. I do not feel the charm of a woman from you. There is no helping it, small breasts are a trait of ourselves. But Luke is not just bad mouthing. In the end, he always says this. Since you are not a woman I can be your friend. Saying we are friends makes me happy, but knowing I have no charm as a woman is troubling. Well, of course compared to Ariel Sama my breasts aren't good. I don't mean it like that. Then what do you mean, don't tell me you are going to reveal your identity to him? Oh I see. I am Fitz, Silent Fitz. And I cannot let him know my identity. What should I do? Isn't it good enough Sylphie? The one you were looking for has been found. Suddenly, Ariel Sama says that with a smile. Ariel Sama is always kind. Sometimes she is strict, and there are also times when she does bad things but she is a kind person. Something very surprising came out of this Ariel Sama's mouth. As a special case, you can reveal your identity to that Rudius San. What? Reveal my identity. But, what if doing that causes the plan to fail? I do know my role very well. I'm a mystery. I am an unidentified, symbol of power. In these past few years, I figured that I won't lose to those run-of-the-mill magicians. It is thanks to the training with Rudy, I am not as good as the god or king rank magicians, but I should be around the saint rank at least. Though I can't replace the other princes or king rank magicians whose support the princess needs. But, I am aware that I am the most powerful ally that the princess has at the moment. I had Sophie do her best up until now, I have to at least let you have your reunion right. But. And if the plan fails because of that, then we will think about it then. Ariel Sama after saying that and clapping her hand said. And, if it comes down to ensnaring him, a childhood friend has a better chance in talking him into it, right, thank you, Ariel Sama. I thanked her honestly. Though I saw her scheming something, but it's the usual. 
After seeing my growth, what would Rudy say? I am looking forward to it.